What do you think I should do? Should I start treatment or you know, not, I guess. This was not at all what I thought my mom had brought me to Panera to discuss. Usually the soup and sandwich juggernaut is reserved for catching each other up on our lives, letting my daughter get something bad for herself from the pastry case and leaving me with promising my mom I'll stop by more and her complaining that I don't. If you have bad news, you go to Boudin, not Panera. <laughs> it's not usually the go-to location for decisions of life and death, but here we are. My mom's cancer had come back for a third time, and this time she had serious doubts about getting any sort of treatment. Of course, not getting treatment meant the cancer would slowly eat away at her body, spread, and eventually she would die, barring any kind of miracle, which at this point we seem to be fresh out of. My mom kept talking about her options as my then four-year-old daughter sprawled across the booth and complained that she was bored. She was four. She had never known her grandma had cancer, doesn't know what cancer is, and only knew that people were talking, old people. And let's face it, that's boring. <laughs> to be fair, we were entering hour two of the conversation, which was way too late to bring up something so serious, and also because no matter what my mom was saying, there were only two options. It was so black and white that even the simpleness of it made me angry. This time, the third time was so much different than the first. The first time my mom told me she had cancer was nine years previous while we sat at her friend Elaine's house. It was in her bile ducts, which is basically pancreatic cancer, and if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, you don't really come back from it unless you're Alex Trebek. I'll take certain death for 500, Alex. Oh, it's today's daily double. It's spread to the liver. At this time, she was uncertain about stages or prognosis or anything. Several tests still had to be done, and she just wanted me to know so that I could come with her to the doctor's appointment the next day. Looking for some levity, I told her that I'd have to move some things around, but I'd try to make it. <laughs> Listen, if you guys don't laugh at these things, oh, we're not going to get through it, all right? <laughs> it's been a dark damn night, I know, all right? Last one. <laughs> Jesus Christ, don't be scared. Don't be scared. <laughs> she didn't think that joke was funny. But to me, it was either that or vomit and then melt into the couch. The thought of not having my mom around wasn't one I'd ever considered. My mom raised me. My parents split when I was three years old, and my mom moved us from Ohio to San Diego. She raised three kids, two of them fairly shitty and one of them me. Her life was one struggled, followed by another and another, and now here we were. The day after my mom broke the news, we were in her new oncologist's office. We were given the prognosis, stage four, six months to a year. There's a scene in the movie Boogie Nights where Mark Wahlberg's character is sitting on the couch in his drug dealer's house and absolute chaos is happening all around him. But he just stares off into oblivion and shuts out everything. The camera stays on him for an uncomfortably long time. I never understood that scene until I found myself in it. After the word six months to a year, I slipped into a black hole, only it wasn't black. It was filled with colors, white, Gray, the muted pastels that adorn hospitals as if that palette would soften harsh blows that come in the form of soft vocal tones. There were corners of green, brown, and sometimes pink that framed the flyers for support groups for this cancer or that cancer. The headlines of the terminally ill times as I would quip to my mom months later. My brain felt like it was sucked back through a straw when my mom's best friend Elaine, whose house we'd been at the day before, asked if I had any questions. This was the first time I scanned the room for faces. There was a doctor, a very petite but extremely gentle Asian woman, for which my terribly trained brain made several stereotypical assumptions in the span of five seconds. <laughs> of course her doctor is Asian. And thank God her doctor is Asian. <laughs> then there was my mom's face completely hung, sagging in every direction as if it was trying to escape whatever was happening inside her mind. Tears flowing uncontrollably, but still the determination to give off a sense of fight. And then, of course, there was my mom's best friend, Elaine, the strong-willed Jesus freak, but, you know, in a good way. <laughs> a small, round woman who packed an emotional wallop when needed, someone you wanted on your side who would sweep in and out of scenes like a brash narrator that no one seemed to mind. She had a notepad out writing down information, asking several questions, writing down phone numbers and names, being meticulous, as I guess one should be, and as I assumed she knew I wouldn't be able to handle. Do you have any questions, she asked again. I shook my head no. We all stood. The doctor hugged my mom. Elaine had us all hold hands and pray. This might seem comical and downright ridiculous, but I'd be damned if it wasn't the warm sun shining down on my face after standing in the rain. We walked to the counter to schedule my mom's first chemo treatment. 
Elaine commented on how strong I was being. I don't remember saying anything back. She said again, if you have any questions, just ask. I've been through this before. I walked outside. I threw up on a loading dock. I cried so hard I thought my throat was going to explode. Questions? What fucking questions could I ask? What questions are there? Was there cancer? Yes. Was it going to kill my mom? 95% sure. Great. So fucking happy I asked those questions. I paced the loading dock, fuming at the audacity that anyone had talked to me. I called my girlfriend, who I had been dating only for two months. I cried into the phone and told her she could break up with me because she was clearly not what signed, this was clearly not what she had signed up for. She politely declined. I called my closest friend in the world and asked him to let all our other friends know and also ask if they wouldn't give me any shit about anything for a while. As best friends, this was our favorite sport, but for the foreseeable future, I was going to be on the bench. <laughs> I called my dad. I walked back into the hospital, and we began. I drove my mom home, and she sat on the couch. I didn't know what was going to come out of her mouth. She just stared at me for a good two minutes, which is honestly a very long time in silence. Way longer than you think. Like, remember in PE when we had to do the wall sit for an entire minute, and then like 20 seconds in, you're like, how fucking long is a minute? I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Taking in my mom's silence, feeling a resemblance to a moment of silence, I broke it as quick as I could. I started to go over information with her, planning out a schedule, car rides, and then she just blurted out, I don't want to die. Then we both just started crying. I knelt down, put my head on her shaking lap, and closed my eyes, desperately begging for it to be a dream. I felt more and more tears drop on my head as my mom lost any and all ability to stop herself from breaking into pieces. We sat crying for way longer than I thought we would, and then I looked up at her with a resolve I didn't earn nor felt particularly confident about and said, this is it. This is the day we cry. Get it all out because today is the only day we can be sad about this. You're going to beat this shit. I don't care what the doctors say or what the statistics are. You're going to beat it. We don't get to be sad after today. We have to keep going. My mom agreed. She began treatment after about six months. She was in partial remission. It was partial because my mom had gastric bypass surgery about a decade prior, and because of the surgery, they could never actually see the tumor in her bile duct. So since they could never see it, they had to assume it was probably still there, but it had stopped it from shredding, and the shadow of the tumor had shrunk, whatever. We celebrated. <laughs> a, couple, a couple years later, I got married to that same girl who declined to break up with me. My mom got to walk me down the aisle. She got to make my wedding cake, which is someone who ran an award-winning side business as a wedding cake baker she had always dreamed of doing. She worked two jobs for almost my entire childhood, sometimes three. In her early 20s, she became a nurse, a job she held until her late 20s when she had to have a benign brain tumor removed. After that, it was odd jobs, administrative work, and a nursing instructor for those schools that you see in commercials when you're at home watching Judge Judy instead of having a real job. <laughs> By the time I had reached my 20s, she had been working in numerous positions at Kaiser Permanente, finally finding a lasting one in the DME department. This department is responsible for approving and sending out medical equipment. This means she pretty much knew every doctor in Southern California, which unbeknownst to us would put her in a fantastic position if, say, she ever got a terminal illness. The second time was soon after my wedding. She told me her cancer had come back and it again it had spread to her liver. This time was a lot more relaxed and done through a quick phone call. My mom seemed to be even a little ambivalent to it, like one might be with their second baby. The first one isn't allowed to touch anything, but the second one can lick old gum off a railing as long as I get some goddamn peace and quiet. <laughs> My mom was so relaxed about it all that we all kind of just figured it was going to be no big deal. We'd already beaten the six months to a year nonsense, so this was going to be a piece of cake. However, this time she didn't want to go through chemo again, which had taken its toll to the tune of ringing ears, numb fingers, and the type of forgetfulness my mom called chemo brain, but what everyone else called age. <laughs> her oncologist suggested the possibility of surgery to remove the tumor on her liver. The only problem was no one would do the surgery given her diagnosis, which because of the partialness of her remission was still pancreatic cancer. That's when my mom's primary doctor got involved. Her name was Dr. Stain. She had come over from Ireland in the 1990s and didn't mix words or take shit. She was also my primary doctor and had once told me, if you don't stop eating like an idiot, your heart's going to explode and you'll die. <laughs> she was awesome. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Stain had also had a sick mother who relied on the correct medical equipment being delivered to her house as quickly as possible, and for that to happen, you needed a friend in the DME department. My mom was that friend. But not just for Dr. Stain, for any Kaiser doctor. My mom had immense respect for every doctor she ever encountered, knew how hard they worked, and never wanted them to worry that their loved ones wouldn't get what they needed in time. During a checkup, I had mentioned to Dr. Stain that no one would do the surgery, and that's when she cut me off, spun her stool around, picked up her cell phone, and made a, fall to, made a phone call to someone, who, I don't know, but it was a quick call in which she sternly told whoever it was on the other end, Lynn McLaughlin is from the DME department, the one who made sure all your family members had what they needed, rushed equipment to your patients, went around insurance when necessary, and took care of all of you. And then she hung up, spun back around, and said, you get your flu shot, go get your flu shot. Two weeks later, we were prepping for surgery. <laughs> My mom was back in partial remission. Shadows abound, but we celebrated nonetheless. We get to keep going. About a year later, my wife and I had a daughter. My mom was there to hold her grandbaby. She spoiled her rotten within minutes, just as she always dreamed of doing. Then, about three years later, my daughter and I met her for lunch at Panera. And as my daughter sprawled out across the booth, my mom informed me that for the third time her cancer had come back, and this time it spread to two different places. She was going to be required to start chemo immediately, and this particular brand of chemo wasn't going to be fun. Of course, I know that no brand of chemo is ever fun, but the doctor had specifically mentioned that this new stuff would give her all the bad side effects. My mom didn't know what to do. Her quality of life became a real question, a question she asked me as I ate my baguette and stared at my daughter. I can't answer that, Mom. Do I want you to be alive? Yes. Do I want you to have to go through all the bullshit? No, of course I don't. But how hard is it going to be? Hard, she replied. The last time I went through chemo, it was bad. I don't want to live that way, especially given there's an extremely small chance it works this time. I let her talk. I let her vent. I let her yell at her granddaughter, who once again announced what we were talking about was boring and that she wanted to go home. So did I. That night, I put my daughter to bed opened a bottle of Tillamore Dew and drank, and drank. And then my wife came home and asked why I was drunk. I told her, but couldn't even get the words out before I turned into a blubbering mess. We both cried for a few minutes, but this time there was no picking ourselves up. There was no, this is our one day to cry ultimatum. This time was different. We were all different. We'd been through the ringer for years now, and it seemed like we all were just tired. But no one more than my mom, who texted me that evening, I prayed. I'm not going to do treatment. Let's just enjoy what time we have left. Enjoy. Enjoy what? This woman, my mom, the one who broke herself down so I never went without, the one who found creative ways to make spam or tuna or hot dogs taste like top-notch cuisine, the one who tried not to turn red in the grocery store as her kids would loudly cry about being poor because we had to buy bottom-shelf cereal in a bag. Was that the life she enjoyed? all that she'd been through, what part of this life had she enjoyed? Was it when my dad walked out on her? Was it when she brought her family across the country to start a new life for which she worked her way up from the bottom and still landed in the middle? Was it when she gained so much weight from depression that she could barely walk anymore, completely tearing her knees to shreds? Was it when my sister had kids, walked out and left my mom to raise them? Is that what she enjoyed? Was it when 99% of the people in her life took advantage of her kindness and her blinding trust? Was that the life that she wanted to keep enjoying? If you asked my mom, she would say, yeah. You'd stare at her, perplexed, pissed off. But she would tell you as she tells me, it brought us all here together. And to top it off, I got to see you be a great dad. She would then follow that up by saying something like, so it'd be great to see you once in a while and the grandbaby, but everyone's busy, I know, I know. <laughs> You can take the woman out of Catholicism, but you can't take the debilitating guilt out of the woman. <laughs> the fight we'd all pursued over the years was now just a draw. My mom sat like a retired boxer who wasn't able to get back into the ring, but you wouldn't dare cross her because the last thing to go is always the punch. We all settled into my mom's decision and plans began to be drawn up. My mom's best friend, Elaine, had turned from prayer warrior to practical sage, helping with legal paperwork, phone calls, and even real estate advice. No one had given up, because that's not what death is. I'd love to say this story has a happy ending, but in the last year, my mother's health has rapidly declined, going from a respectable large, as she would say, to an extra small. 
but at her request, we have tried our best to enjoy it by crossing off some bucket list items. We went to Ireland, the motherland, as my mom calls it. We stayed overnight at the Disneyland Hotel, a dream she's had since she was a little girl. We bought her a brand new couch. It's the little things, I guess. <laughs> she's been in hospice care for a year, and if you know anything about hospice, it's usually set up for six months max. But as her nurses say, your mom is one strong lady. She's going to go till the wheels come off. She's stubborn. <laughs> the nurses she has are all black women, one from Jamaica, and this makes my mother infinitely happy. If she had her way, she would have been born Aretha Franklin. <laughs> Most of what my mom knows about black culture is from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, but still. <laughs> she loves sitting around and talking to her nurses, or her girls, as she calls them. And honestly, her nurses adore her. She's holding on for something, one of them said to me once. We just don't know what. I do. She just wants to keep going. Dallas McLaughlin, everybody.